Uh, it is, it is, ooh, Sunday, May 31st. Yeah, like this, we're basically in the second half of the year. Um, by the time you hear this, this is basically the last minutes of the first half of 2020, a, a, a 2020 that no one, no one expected in any way, shape, or form to go how it's been going. Um, and at this point, if you have lived under a rock, um, the last 48 hours or so have produced a series of of outcry and protests for the the killing of another unarmed black person, particularly um, Mr. George Floyd, but as well as uh, Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery, who have also been killed recently, whose deaths have been more in the national spotlight. Um, this comes really after a decade of seeing, a decade plus of seeing the last moments of, of black people's lives caught on camera. And it's a reflection of what, the state of the country is right now from everything from the pandemic to the Trump campaign to the financial collapse. We're going through a lot at the same time. And normally in most cases, there's one or the other, but never all at the same time. And so for a lot of people just mentally, it's been hard to kind of just assess where they are personally. And so I reached out to someone. Um, he is an alum um, of the best school in Atlanta, um, Georgia is. state university. Um, I've known him actually for a while and we're, before we even talked, I really didn't realize that he was a therapist for all of these years. And I apologize for that. Uh, but this is Mr. Vaughn Gay. He has uh, a practice known as Holistic Atlanta. He has been doing a lot of efforts to just reach out to people online and in person just about mental health, how to assess yourself and what to do in the face of many, many challenges going on. So at this point, I'm going to let Vaughn introduce more of himself. But thank you once again, Vaughn, for, for taking some time out today. No, I appreciate it, Jared. And uh, actually, King, I, you know, I know it's, you it's either it's one. We, yeah, yeah, but his thing, it's either one. Like, uh, if you ask my parents, like, they'll say either one. So, like, it doesn't really bother me. Yeah, so, you know, and yeah. That, that comes from us just going back all the way to our days in high school at Stevenson High. And you know, just being <laughs> able to see you kind of progress into your own space and really taking taking ownership of, of telling the story of Atlanta, you know, and making sure that, you know, those those – uh, smaller stories that we may not hear of on a big scale, you know, you really kind of become a king within your own right, you know, so <laughs> you definitely got to address you, you know, in, in the spaces you're in. So, King, oh, I yeah. appreciate you having me on the, uh, the podcast today. Um, Dr. Von Gay, I actually just... Oh, respect. Let me put some respect on your name. Let me put some respect on it. My bad, my bad, my bad. just finished up uh, at Southern Cal, USC, Fight on Trojans. All right. uh, you know, so I've been working in the field of mental health, uh, I say since 2009, because that's when I completed my graduate studies at Georgia Southern University. Okay. And then I came back to Atlanta and just started my clinical training out on the southwest side of Atlanta. Um, this was back before this was pre-gentrification. Um, so I actually can remember uh, when they would come around and when some of the small organizations would come around and survey the homeowners and pass out pamphlets. And they was talking about this really, you know, cool plan to link all the parks together and how it's going to improve everybody's lives in Atlanta. And little I did we that. know it was going to change the face of the city, right? Yeah. And so even, you know, even with us dealing with all these different things nationally, you know, Atlanta, I've been, you know, having this conversation with a lot of people. Atlanta's having a, an identity crisis right now. So, uh, but to go back to pick up, um, you know, I finished my graduate studies in 2009, started in the field of mental health. Uh, was working in, in the SWATs out in Southwest Atlanta and just uh, got exposed to, in, into a, um, a space where I started to realize that Black people specifically and those that are in you know, low socioeconomic statuses, uh, they experience symptomology of multiple mental illnesses and behavioral health disorders. And not only were they not receiving treatment, they didn't even know that there was a, a process of being able to identify some of those things. So we define certain things as culturally, right? the way that our parents may talk to us, you know, the way that, you know, we may kind of been controlled with our behaviors growing up. We call it culture. Yeah. You know, but as we've kind of gotten into this space now, we're starting to realize, hey, some of these things are actually diagnosable and you can trace them back across mm. generations. Uh, behaviors and emotions and thoughts and even diagnosable illnesses can be traced back through um, generations through your family system the same way that uh, high blood pressure, the hypertension, you know, the sugar and all those kinds of things yeah. can be traced back through our, through our uh, family as well. So, um, being in that space in 2009, uh, mental health was not a big thing. You know, this was right around the, the recession. So this was Obama's first year. And so there was just um, a lot of calamity going on with our economy the way that we're seeing right now. And so I was in this space uh, going through my years of clinical training to get licensed through the state. Did so um, in 2013. 
2000, excuse me, 2015, I got licensed, took on a couple of different appointments um, and found myself at Morehouse School of Medicine working in the Office of Counseling Services as the assistant director, which is where I am currently, and then also running my private practice, which is the long-term goal for me is to, you know, to build not only just a mental health practice, but also a healthcare brand and an entity so that, you know, our community can have that direct access. And we, you know, we, we do away with the barriers by building you know, the solution and, and having ownership of that and dictating how you can get access to treatment. We're going to go to the people with medical services and that way we're going to be able to directly have an impact on decreasing uh, health disparities within our community. So that's, you know, in terms of where we're at within our culture and community and our contribution and things along those lines, that's the space I've been able to find myself in. And it's really been a blessing, uh, especially with mental health, you know, really just blowing up over the last five uh, to 10 years and, and just kind of being on the forefront and being immersed and already having those relationships with people that have been in the game for a while. It's really given me a, a great opportunity to build a platform in that space. And I'm glad that you're doing it because we see with times like now, why, to be honest, like why we need black mental health professionals, why we need more men in the mental health space. And then just people who had like the cultural context as to kind of speak to what's going on. And so yeah. it's good also, that you're here. I was going to say, you know, being a therapist, and it's, it's not a, it wasn't a career goal or a path that I originally started on. I wanted to be a physician, and then I wanted to be a uh, computer engineer, then a software designer. So all those different things you you that pique your interest yeah. uh, when you are in undergrad, right? Right. But you ha you have a calling, and you just have things that you've always been drawn towards, things that you've been really good at. Um, even back in high school, when I was in the marching band and placed in a leadership position, just being given an, an, an opportunity to connect with people on a personal level and lead and guide them, I had no clue that that was my um, passion to talk to folks, you know, and, and being a caregiver and my family's history of medicine. That's kind of how I found myself in this space. And so it's when you, when you, you know, know your value and understand your calling, it's really easy to kind of, you know, start to build a lane, you know, to where you're able to make some decent money, but also having a really good impact on folks. Um, and within this space, you know, I just want my legacy to be, you know, when we had the opportunity to stretch this out and, and give as many people access to it, we did that. And we also created lanes for those coming behind us to be able to take that on and take it to the next level. Respect. And so now I kind of want to, because of where we are, I want to jump into a bunch of different things first, because mm -hmm. I think there's something you can offer to every single person who's afflict, who's facing something. The first is going to be the most important right now, which is what do you say to someone who has essentially just, they don't know what to deal with, with the latest police killing mm -hmm. on top of, not, we're not even going to include the riots right now, just the issue of another police killing. Like, What do you say to people who are just having issues with that? You know, so this is not, I just went live earlier this morning because I needed to be able to, to have a way just to express my thoughts and feelings. Um, I do a lot of observing as a therapist. I'm always observing social media. Don't post as much. Um, definitely will be moving forward, but I just need to be able to create my own type of space just to, to have a mind dump and get my thoughts out. Um, you know, being a, a someone that is a huge fan of history, you know, and knowing, you know, American history and the history of Black America and the history of Black Atlanta and all those things, uh, this is not the first, nor will it be the last time that this has happened, unfortunately, right? Um, there's, I referenced a book called 100 Years of Lynching, mm. right? Now think about, think about that, right? Yeah. 100, 100 years of lynching, like actually hanging people from trees, right? As a way to reinforce a system that, you know, we... The ideology is we're so entrenched in this way of thinking that we will kill you to preserve this system that is allowing us to have dominance of economic resources. That's what we're really talking about, right? And so as a person that has to observe this and knows the history of your people and know that they've been victimized in these ways, whether it's you know, being hung from a tree, whether it is being lashed on their back, you know, with, with whips on plantations, if it is, you know, being eight years old and, and, you know, being a kid watching the Rodney King video, you know, and that being part of creating your perspective on the world, um, you know, or even, you know, at this point in time right now, you know, being an adult man in his mid thirties and seeing this, it never gets easier. It never gets better. Um, it's, there's never a time where you're saying, okay, this is palatable. I can accept this, right? There's no one that saw that video of George Floyd that did not say, okay, get the hell up off of him. But like, you've proven your point. But this is what people weren't paying attention to. This cop knew that he was on camera. The other cop that was standing watched knew that he was on camera. The two other cops that were on his body behind the car knew that they were out of the camera's view. And so what that message says to us, just kind of collectively, the way it enters our psychology is, I am showing you 
that I am okay with this. I am showing you that you know, I understand the dynamic of me as a white officer. This is a black man that we're criminalizing. You have it on camera. We know it's going to go viral. We know the era that we're in, et cetera, right? I am okay with this. And so for me, wrapping my head around that ideology and just that way of thinking um, is very difficult, right? Very difficult. And so this weekend, um, you know, what we saw was a lot of peaceful demonstrations, a lot of people kind of getting together just to be able to express their thoughts, their feelings amongst people that, um, you know, have the same similar ideology as them. You know, and unfortunately, because we don't engage in this process consistently enough and practice and build a framework and, and have a plan and a structure, what happened this weekend was that energy got co-opted and it turned into an absolute um, melee is what we got. And so when, when the dust settles from all of this, you know, to, to circle back to answer your question, when the dust settles from all of this, we're still left with the bag. The same way that everyone that looks just like me and you, King, um, you know, going back, you know, hundreds of years have been left with the residue of slavery and the residue of Jim Crow. We've been the ones that have left the, that have been left the dealing with it and fixing it, right? Our government, unfortunately, has said and has shown us, you know, uh, we may or may not have some intervention. But it's gone on way too long. We've had enough evidence to see, okay, so this one way of trying to do this thing is not working, right? Um, and so for us as black men, you know, we have to, th this is one of those seminal moments in your life where you're either going to have a, a, a mindset of intentional behavior consistently or the mindset of, you know, we can't do anything about it. It's going to take whatever comes to you. All right. And so the next thing I want to ask is, uh, we're talking now specifically, you kind of segued into it, which is this notion of the protests and the looting, because there seems to be a bunch of different thoughts on that. And there seems to be a lot of people going in different ways in ways that are both contradictory and also very, very complementary of each other. So can you talk to people about that thought process? You know, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, you know, I pride myself on just being able to, to put things together and be able to make sense out of stuff, right? You know, those I'm personally connected to, we have a lot of long conversations in depth. You know, we look at it from a lot of different perspectives. This is one of those moments where I actually sat back and said, wow as I watched things unfold on Friday. And I saw some things, I saw um, a couple of folks that were down at the protest at uh, Centennial Park early in the day. So, okay, cool, you know, this is always, this is, a, you know, you definitely need a place, uh, even if it's just in terms of the model of being a support group, right? You need people to be able to have that space to be able to get that energy out, you know, share some thoughts and, and kind of strategize on how to move forward. But um, I didn't recognize that it was turning into something differently until I kind of lay down on the couch that night around 10, 1030. And I turned on the news and I saw Mayor Bottoms on the news and it, it, her, Killer Mike and T.I. So I'm listening. I said, wait a minute. And when I saw things going on, I said to myself, wow. OK, so yesterday I saw uh, some of the folks in Minneapolis. They were throwing bricks in the cop cars and it, it just yeah. kind of seemed like folks from the community getting their rage out, et cetera. Right. What we saw on Friday night in Atlanta and across other cities, it looked very calculated, planned, and staged. Yeah. And when we, and when we started to see, um, what I started noticing was that we were seeing a lot of white kids and white adults on camera destroying businesses that had, it had no type of parallel with the energy of what was going on out there. But it was the it it looked as if black people were being blamed for this. I said, okay, so this there's more to this than what we're seeing, more to it. And I, I pushed back. Uh, this is just my opinion, not fact. I pushed right. back a little bit on the energy that was given from Mayor Bottoms and and Ti when they gave the press conference because essentially it was framed as if it was a conversation from a black mom to her unruly black sons, right? Right. And that they needed to take their behinds home and stuff, you know. And so I just thought that that was. It didn't have a, a bigger scope on it, you know, because yeah. that message needed to be delivered to the people of Atlanta and not just, you know, the black community that was really in mourning. And it feels like we've been robbed of this moment to a degree because it's been co-opted and it's just been turned into something that has absolutely nothing to do with uh, the issues that we've been having to deal with for centuries in this country. Right. And it was, that was the other thing I've noticed, too, because I was watching it in real time. Uh, like just like you were on channel two and I could hear and like the the anchor Jovita's Mo voice Moore's voice change in real time is like she's going yeah. from both like questioning things to fearful to confused and then I was like okay you know there's a lot of people who are going to see this and there's right 
there's a lot of people who are not going to be able to process because the person who's giving you the information herself is like not able to process what's going on. In right, real time. right. 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 And, and to so, be fair, also, yeah. also no, 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 no. to be, to be fair, um, people in leadership positions are people still, right. And placing yourself in that position under pressure during multiple crises and you know, not only having to deliver a message to people that you know everyone's not going to agree with you, and you also have colleagues and higher ups that you somewhat have to answer to and who may limit what you can say. That's a very hard position to be at. So I do right. give our mayor, you know, some some. I'm mean, fair in that point as well. Uh, you know, but we can we really do. You know, when we look back at all of this, you know, we'll be able to see a lot of things in hindsight. And you know, it's it's a difficult time. Right. And so that brings us to something else, which is, I kind of mentioned at the top of the, the episode, which is we're going through multiple things in multiple times. And so you as a, as a mental health professional, what have you been seeing on that end of the practice of people who either are coming to you or things that you're observing from people who are dealing with a lot of different types of stress? Yeah, you know, so even before a number of things happened in the month of May, you know, with the different killings, and especially, you know, once the Ahmaud Arbery video came out, then that's when all hell pretty much broke loose. Yeah. But even before that, I've been doing a lot of work with uh, with teenagers, you know, kids that are out of school mm -hmm. and doing a lot of sessions with their families and groups and just noticing that, you know, this time where we've all been psychologically and physically caged in or boxed in, it is bringing out the best in a lot of us and it's bringing out the worst in a lot of us, right? Even with myself, I realized uh, after about two or three weeks that I had to change my mind frame about this because I no longer had control of when everything was going to go back to normal. And my typical outlets of how I decompressed stress, and, you know, they were, I was no longer able to access them. So I couldn't go to the gym, couldn't go to any um, live music, anything like that. You know, so I had to, number one, change my attitude a little bit. You know, because when anyone is, is detached from the things that they enjoy doing that is part of their, you know, just formula of staying well and feeling great about themselves, that a transition can be very rocky. So we've seen a lot of rockiness in the transition. Um, there's been some some failure in leadership at, at, at some workplaces, you know, and so that's having a trickle down effect on employees and middle level managers and things like that. Uh, you do some, you see some things uh, within the homes. I think I, I forget who, who mentioned it, but they were on a, a live with uh, Yale Wellness and Shanti Das last week, or maybe the week before. And they said, you know, the number of, um, they said domestic violence reports are starting to go up, of course, because you have people staying within the same homes. Yeah. But they say reports of child abuse are going down. And we huh. kind of say, hmm, that's interesting, right? That's a good thing. Well, a lot of times reports of abuse are done first where at the schools so the kids uh, are not in the schools the gotcha. teachers are not able to observe certain things and so you know there's even just when we have the magnifying glass on the big major things we don't pay attention to some of the things that are affecting us on a daily basis so you are seeing pretty much just a lot of the major social issues right mm -hmm. being exacerbated um those that have uh, addiction to substances you know engage in substance abuse you know, if you leave someone that has an addiction, you know, by themselves within their home and detach from the resources that they may have for support, um, or if you detach them away from a means of making money, you know, how do you, how does an addict, you know, uh, how do they deal with that, right? If yeah. you're starting to close down, you know, uh, urgent care facilities, you're shutting down and limiting the the number of people or that can go to the hospital, that can, the, the type of service they can get. Essentially, you have left an entire population to their own devices to be able to get through it from a day to day. And it doesn't matter if, you know, if you're that person that's dealing with, you know, substance abuse or, you know, someone that may be living on the street um, or students. Or, you know, a lot of people are, are, are going through a high, high level of stress. And uh, they, you know, I think a lot of times it's through talk therapy or really kind of accessing some resources and being able to be back around some people to, you know, figuring out how to use Zoom effectively so we can stay connected with the folks we care about. That has to start to, to be very helpful for folks. But initially, we, we, we saw an exacerbation of just major social issues. Right. And so now I want to ask you in particular, which is, uh, if you could help me walk through it, which is, um, what are some ways people can deal with stress or at least decompression, especially in the time of quarantine, and you're probably at home by yourself? Yeah. So I've actually been isolated by myself as well. And I think fortunately for me, uh, even though it's been very stressful, you know, I've been doing a lot of therapy sessions back to back to back. And so it took me probably about three to four weeks to develop a routine and to kind of get my clients in a good scheduling pattern or what have you. And so the majority of my day, I'm pretty much locked in. I'm processing, uh, of course, just being a therapist, I'm able to process some of my own thoughts and feelings um, while we're communicating during sessions. 
but uh, you know, in terms of getting resources, I think that the, or in terms of, of dealing with stress, you have to be able to have control of the things you can control, mm. you know, and that's just, that just goes for any person, any day. You know, if you are in a space to where you have no control over anything and you essentially become affected by whichever, you know, way the wind decides to blow for that day. And so the things you can control, um, starting and stopping at a hard time within home. So if you're doing, if you're working from home, uh, if you have children, you have to have control over that routine and that schedule and make it fun, make it fun for yourself. Right. So if you're, if you're isolated by yourself, Monday may need to be your motivation day. Tuesday may need to be a self-care day. Wednesday, you may need to use, you know, Wednesday may be your wisdom, your wisdom Wednesday. So you may be reading some things that may be providing you some, some affirmations, or you may be looking into, you know, things that uh, you may not be used to doing, learning a new skill, right? Things along those lines. Uh, planning your days out and giving them some things I found has been pretty helpful. Uh, switching up your routine. So once you have a schedule, sometimes you may need to start your day outside going for a walk as opposed to waiting to the middle of the afternoon. Some days you may need to take that laptop to a park if you have a hot spot and just kind of get outside for a minute. Um, as restaurants are starting to open now, they're not being heavily populated. So you may have an opportunity to go and just sit outside on the, on the, on the porch or the balcony, uh, socially distant, of course. But I think this, you know, you have to be able to, to get a grip on the things that you can, the things that you can't, don't overprocess it and don't have a level of anxiety or fear of what can potentially happen if you don't have control over certain things. Right. Well, I like that. And so now I want to kind of stay in that, that topic, which is um, this one's more about and you're you're definitely the expert. And so got me this one. Some people who've had I've, I've talked to some people and they've definitely felt. Um, I don't want to say suicidal, but very, very much in a dark place. Yeah. So what do you say to people who right now are sometimes completely in a dark space or slip in and out of a dark space while we're during this uh, pandemic and all the other things in the world? Okay, so I'll speak on it from two different perspectives. If you're in that dark place, and then if you notice someone that's in that dark place, all right? Okay, good, and good. The, the, the response is kind of parallel. So if you are in a space um, to where you want to cause harm to yourself, that typically just does not come out of nowhere, right? Mm. It normally means that you have either had a pattern of this for a while, or there have been a lot of things that kind of gradually led you to that point. Okay, It may have started a year ago, you know, six months ago, maybe five or six years ago to where you may have had some self-defeating thoughts that may have been reinforced mm -hmm. by some things. You may have had a series of negative uh, life experiences that you just didn't have any control over that it just, it just ended up being a little bit of, of your stroke of luck for whatever reason, right? And so when you get to that dark place, it's not something that just comes from anywhere. There's some things that have happened to you that you reinforce within your mind um, and have to just create the understanding that there's nothing else in this world or no other options that I can tap into that's going to make me feel better, all right? Gotcha. Another thing that I had to understand that uh, self-harm behavior is on the spectrum. Oh, right? so, the okay. so, the, so the lethality of it, right, the, the suicidal ideation, it, we, people tend to kind of grow into that. And so uh, when, I talk to, when I talk to individuals that, that have, you know, just the ideation, you know, they, they typically say the self-harming behavior, um, whether that's someone that cuts or someone that, they're trying to physically abuse themselves in a certain type of way. They may malnourish themselves, right? Oh, they say okay. That, they say that um, they try to elicit a level of physical pain that can help them take their minds off of the emotional pain. Gotcha. So think about that, right? So, so, and if you put yourself in someone's shoes, right, in their world, from their perspective and in their understanding, what they're going through and the thoughts that they have are so painful to them that they have to trigger a different type of a pain to take their minds off of that, right? Okay. And so when someone is in that space, it's not because, you know, that they, uh, there's just something wrong with them and everyone else in the world is okay. No, what that is, is that it's, it's really just finding a way, number one, to get that energy out, and two, finding a way to be able to communicate how they feel about certain stuff. And so what I would say to that person that's in that space is, please, 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 as you are vacillating through whatever negative thoughts that are going through your head, also maybe identify, you know, someone, it may not be someone close and personal to you, but someone that may be willing to just listen to you. Okay. And that's why we have things like hotlines and so that, you know, if you could just reach out to someone just to be able to listen to you in the moment and help you process that thought or that feeling in the moment. And so that would be something that I would say to them, um, always have a, a go-to person, an accountability partner, a support system of people, family, friends, 
um, you know, in this digital space and age, you know, now you can literally pick up your cell phone, click on Instagram, type in, you know, the therapist and whatever city you live in. Hmm. And a lot of, a lot of therapist profiles will come up, right? It's oh, wow. That's cool. Yeah. It's our responsibility to go to you. So if you type in therapy, Atlanta, ATL therapy, uh, male counselor, Atlanta, you will see my info, my profile will come up, right? Through hashtags, mm-hmm. et cetera. And so it's our responsibility to make sure that we have all of our information out there to you so that you can vet us online and say, you know what? I think I want to at least kind of reach out to this person to see if they can help me. Okay. And once you take just that one step, you take that first step, we can help we help you walk the, the rest of the path right along your side with you, right? That, that's what we're trained to do. That's what we went to school for. We're licensed through the state. That's what we did our clinical training for. That's why we continue to do research in our MD spaces now. So it's like, man, you know, we are, it's like, it's like building a store and we're ready for the people to come to us so we can just, you know, assist them or whatever it is that they need. Right. And now I want to ask you, uh, you said it before, like, what do you do if you see, if you identify somebody who you believe may either be in a dark space of any type, like what, what do you say to that? Okay, so we call people like you gatekeepers, right? Oh, okay. So let's just say that you have a friend or a family member that you know, they, you, you, you have a closer personal relationship with them. You just know them, right? Mm-hmm. They may have always kind of just, you know, had that type of energy or they may have been in a space to where they may have lost a loved one, gone through a terrible breakup, you know, lost mm-hmm. a job, lost their home, right? And so they, they may just very well be in a depressive state. And so you as a gatekeeper, number one, you have to identify that shift in their behavioral pattern. That's what friends do. That's what family does, right? They notice when, when you're not feeling well, if, you're, like, you know, you, if you answer the phone when your mom calls and you have a, a you know, down mood, first thing she'll say to you, what's wrong, right? What's kind of going yeah, yeah. on? You yeah. know, so you know, that, you know, so if, if, if she's saying that a number of times to you, then she needs to say, hmm, let me see if I can go and do a little bit of research and maybe find someone and connect him to Jared or to connect him to King just so that, you know, King can know that this resource is available whenever he's ready, right? So being yeah. a gatekeeper, being an extension of both parties, of the therapist and also of the, the family member or the friend or the colleague, the coworker, et cetera, right? And bridging that gap and saying, I know this is a problem. I'm feeling okay to actually go and research some things. Let me do that. And then let me actually ask this person. There's, there's a... a um, an educational framework called QPR. If you what just does that Google mean? It. So that means question, persuade, refer. Okay. That's the process that's been empirically researched in terms of if someone is in a, mm-hmm. a suicidal moment, you question them. Listen, you know, are you in a space right now where you want to take your life? Mm. We can't. So when someone's life is on the line, we can't tiptoe yeah. around at a sugar coating. You know, we can't say, hey, you know. Let me know if you need anything. No, like I've heard you in a space to where you don't you don't sound healthy. You know, do you have a plan and a means to to, to cause some harm to yourself? And that person more than likely is going to say yes or no. If they do, then you have to actually make sure that this person is safe over the next uh, X amount of hours. So you may have to actually say, you know what, I'm going to stay here right here with you and just rock out with you for a little bit. You know, let's yeah. go get some food. Let's, uh, no alcohol, no drinks when anyone is in that space, of course, right? But let's go get some food. Let's watch a movie, you know, but I, you know, my goal is to keep you alive right now because that's how much I love. Right. Okay? And so now, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Go now, ahead. now I kind of want to jump into something you just mentioned a second ago. And you mentioned also at the beginning, which is this notion of substance use. Now I'm going to say substance use versus abuse, because I know some people can, can partake in things and be okay. Right. But, right. Um, you know, there's more and more like, you know, articles coming out about, the number of people who are buying more alcohol, the number of people who mm-hmm. are buying more, you know, like prescription drugs and marijuana, stuff like that. What do you right. say for people who are like self-medicating or just finding an outlet through other means? So self-medicating works really, 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 really good in the moment. And then when okay. that moment is over, when that high comes down or when that, you know, when you're drinking that they, you know, is over, the problem that made you feel a certain type of way is still there. And it continuously triggers you and if you have started to condition your brain chemically that whenever there's an issue, uh, okay. I'll give it some, some THC, right? Some alcohol, uh, some mm-hmm. prescription pills. Then whenever I'm feeling this way, all I need is the substance and it'll make me feel okay no matter what's going on around me. And you develop a, 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 a behavioral pattern of dependence as opposed to developing a behavioral pattern of resilience, which is what okay. you gave you. You know, everyone has to have a level of resilience if you want to stay alive long enough, right? No one is 80 years old and ain't been through nothing. They've yeah, probably yeah. been through more, yeah. you know, than, than you would even know, right? So you have to have a level of resilience. If everyone, you know, used substances just to get through life, then you, no one would make it past 50, 
<laughs> right, right. And so, yeah, I encourage folks, you know, I know a lot of people that, you know, will smoke weed or have a glass of wine every day or, um, you know, you can take it to the next level. Some people, you know, pop pills to party and all those kinds of things. What right. you're doing, you're putting chemicals in your body. And every time you do, you change the chemical composition of your brain. And whether you know it or not, your brain will actually need that substance as part of it. Uh, it's almost kind of like gas in the car, hmm. right? Okay. If you change, if you change out, you know, the, the type of gas that you can put in the car, you know, the, the car's gonna be dependent on that now. And that's yeah. what we're doing. And so when you're when you're self-medicating, understand that doesn't do away with the problem that's triggering the thoughts and the emotions that you're having. Okay. And I, I'm glad you said that because now I want to go on the reverse end. Like there's some there is at least a one person I know. Um, who had been sober for like maybe a year, two years or so, and then had a relapse because of, of COVID. So what do you say to people who are struggling with that, who've been sober for a while, but now just everything, plus being in the house by themselves with no person to talk to you like yourself, right, they're right. really, really tempted to relapse. Right. And that's why I'm so happy that within the field of, field of mental health, they shifted in treating um, substance use and addiction as a disease and not a social issue. You know, for a long mm. time, it was a social issue. They pretty much said if you are, you know, addicted to substances, then that's on you, right? Yeah. And so for those, and so for those that, um, you know, are battling addiction or, you know, even with a relapse, you have to understand and be a little fair, you know, especially for those that have gotten clean and gotten sober, right? Right. It took, it took discipline. Discipline is one of the most important medications for the disease of addiction, all right? Discipline. You literally almost have to go through a daily fight of pushing away, you know, the weed or the marijuana or the pills, right? Because, you know, we have chemically changed the, the composition of our brains. And so it takes a lot of time for your brain to be able to rewire itself. And so um, when you're looking at something like um, the pandemic, what we did was we detached people from their daily lives. We detached, you know, your, your friend or your colleague, we detached them from their entire system of support that kept them from using substances, right? And we gave them all the ample time and opportunity to use them. Right. If you and just think about, you know, the level of discipline that, that takes to not, you know, partake, uh, you know, very difficult. So, uh, you know, it's, it's understandable how, you know, that does happen. Right. And now I want to uh, ask you in particular, I want to go back for a second, which is stake. I know this is kind of like a darker place, but I want to keep going in that direction, which uh -huh. is people right now. And again, I don't know if you deal with this aspect of it, so you can correct me, but people who are having like relationship issues, either in a romantic yeah. sense or a friendship sense where uh -huh. they're just having conflict with like people who are close to them. Like, what do you say to that? Or how do you deal with that? You know, this, there are times, uh, this time has been very beneficial for a lot of couples, spending a lot more time together, right? Uh, being able to explore new things, having really good conversations. It's also been a very, very dark place for folks. Um, I know uh, there, there are couples who've been breaking up, you know, during yeah. the pandemic. You know, there are, you know, again, I think it, it goes back to that same thing. You know, when you are placing people in a space, when you're taking people away from work, you know, where they spend the majority yeah. of their day, and now they're just in the home environment, you know, with their partner and you all are not used to being around each other that much. Mm. You know, you are, it, it almost comes like overexertion a little bit. So think about this. Think about if you went to the gym once a week, right? You did that every week for, let's just say a year. And then all of a sudden your trainer comes to you and says, you have to go to the gym every single day and do the same exercise. You're going to overexert yourself. And so you know, the, the, the smart couple, the healthy couple, you know, doesn't just go into this space or come out of it saying, oh, we'll be okay. Let's just kind of do the same thing we've always been doing, right? All right? I think that, you know, those that live with one another, you know, it's okay to take breaks from, from each other. You know, sometimes you may have to get in the car and just drive around for an hour or so, or maybe go for a walk in the park by yourself. You allow yourself still some you time, allow yourself to be, you know, you can still be your person and be an individual, right? Because that you, you separate yourself from that, that the, I guess the monotony of being in each other's space all the time, yeah. you can actually be pouring, you can be pouring some good fuel into it by reinvesting in yourself. It also gives your partner a break. It lowers the expectations, um, intentional behavior. You know, if you see your partner cooking every single day, you got to yeah. step in and do some of that. You know, if the clothes need to be folded, if, they, you know, if you see your partner working all day long, you know, you can't just kind of just chill. You know, you, it takes some intentional collective behavior if you want this to let, I mean, a couple, you're supposed to be working as a unified, uh, uh, a unit anyway, as a unified force. So if you just understand and step outside the entire picture, you know, you really see that, you know, you just kind of have to have some intentional behavior and thoughts and process and talk often. Right. And I want to ask 
ne- the next level of relationship, which is people who have children. Uh, and I want to separate them into two types, like children who are actually young children who need a lot of like guidance and a lot of supervision. And then children who are older that they may now start having verbal or other types of disagreements with. You know, this, who man, I'm not sure which side of the, of the, the coin you want to be on with that one, right? <laughs> <Okay>. uh, <laughs> All right. Um, if, you, if you don't have children, right, mm-hmm. understand that it is probably one of the most difficult things that you'll ever do in your life once you do. And I don't mean that from a negative perspective. I just mean that, you know, if you're not used to having a child, you just don't know what to expect. Right. And that's not what you see on Instagram or not what you see yeah. when you kind of hang out with someone's kid. Like there's a, you know, there's a daily continuation of having to take care of someone else. And, you know, when you used to, when you're, you've been able to send them off to daycare, you know, get a couple of hours of recharging your battery for yourself. Um, when you're, when you're able to, to, uh, you know, go off to the store, you know, and the other partner is there to, to be able to watch the kid, you know, is you, you have some time to be able to recharge your battery. I empathize with those, you know, I've been at home with, with multiple children. I um, was doing a session the other day and literally the, the kid that I was doing the session with and, and his sibling, you know, get into a fight right there. And, and the parent was just like, you know, you've been dealing with this for forever, you know, for right. the last couple of months. So I really empathize with that. I think that um, the more you incentivize kids and the more that you create a structure and a routine for them, you'll understand that kids actually want structure. You know, they don't, you know, they don't really want to just give it a run around and just do whatever all day, every day, because that's what's going to cause chaos and madness. And then you also have to empower them. So giving them roles and responsibilities every single day, shifting them, teaching them new things, um, you know, teaching them certain things that you may have always said, you know what, I want to be able to do this with my children. Well, now we have plenty of time. And so I think that, you know, uh, that's something, an environment, a situation that you can control a lot more than you think. The school thing, I think, was just a complete disaster, you know, going okay. from yeah, you know, just in school to trying to force feed and force this whole virtual thing. It blew up in everyone's faces as you can kind of predict it would have. But, you know, I, I also have to give a huge kudos to teachers and school admins uh, for at least trying to do something to supplement the separation. Um, with the teenagers, you know, this is, I think, that initially, um, this speaking to the ones that I've been working with, initially they loved it. It was cool. You know, they thought yeah. that, you know, just be a week or two to be back in school. Uh, now, I think within like the second or third month, they were saying, you know, it would mm. kind of hit them. And they're saying, man, I didn't realize that, uh, you know, that was the last time I was going to see my friends. You know, those are moving yeah. from elementary school to middle school, middle school to high school, high school to college, right? Yeah. Uh, the, the graduations, you know, they try to do it as, as good as possible. But there were just so many things that were missed. Prom. And, right. and uh, it was, you know, a lot of the, the end of year activities, kids look forward you know, to the pizza parties and the ice cream parties. And it's yeah. just, uh, it was a huge shift for a lot of them. So, uh, but now you're starting to see the the, the anxious energy, right? Because now right, school right. is over. It's the summertime. They're looking forward to camps and being able to go on vacation. And to me, this is the dangerous area a little bit because this is typically mm. always the teenager's time, the summertime. Right. And so now, um, you know, there's not some structure in place. They're going to be the ones who are ready to kind of break out of the house. And you have to remember, it's still a pandemic going on. You know, right, it's still right. a, a a virus that's out here that, you know, unfortunately, more people are going to get sick. So that's kind of what we're saying, the differences between children and the teenagers as well. Okay. And I know that's so many, like, heavy things to talk about. And I kind of want to lighten it up with just a tad bit, which is um, cool. you've been really, but no, you've been on Instagram and you've been really active. You did a live this morning. Um, just talking about different things and being active with just giving people tips or like single techniques. On the more positive side, what could you be doing right now from a mental health perspective to kind of keep yourself in a good space or to, to, to elevate yourself into a good space? You know, I think the power of affirmations is so important. Um, that's actually, you know, we think about the love languages and how people express themselves and what speaks to them. Uh, affirmations, words of affirmations is one of mine. And I, I literally have to wake up and affirm the day. Because mm-hmm. every day I don't wake up with a great attitude and a great mood. Um, there are often times where I'm in meetings or in sessions at 8, 9 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And, you know, I've, I've conditioned myself just to be able to flip the switch on and go. But there are a lot of times where I will end the day frustrated, you know, tired, um, feeling unsupported. And I think that, you know, having, you know, being able to set the tone for the day is key. But also having um, uh, someone to vent to, I think, is very good in the mm. evenings, right? And, you know, really kind of helping them frame that conversation and letting that person know, listen, like, I really, you know, appreciate you allowing me just to kind of just 
dump my thoughts and my feelings. And, you know, that's your time to laugh about it, cry about it, you know, but you have yeah, to be yeah. able to get, you know, if you're in a, a, a situation like me or in a space like me, if you're, you know, in a high intense, high demanding field, um, you know, you have to be able to get that energy out. Otherwise, this is going to escalate and escalate. And I actually found myself, I did a podcast on it, found myself in a pattern of being addicted to stress because I mm. wasn't, um, okay. you know, I wasn't decompressing in the right way. And so I gotten so used to going so hard to where if I wasn't every single day, I was feeling guilty and felt like I should have been doing more. Right? right. And from a biological perspective, I was getting addicted to the adrenaline rush of having a lot of stuff to do, knocking it all out and then feeling good about myself. That's crazy. Right. Like from a, a physical health perspective, that's debilitating. And so um, I think limiting, uh, limiting things like the number of Zoom meetings that you're having. Uh, more, <laughs> yeah. uh, seriously, if you think about it, more than two a day is too much, right? Okay. It's, okay, it's okay to stay, it's okay to socially disconnect, emotionally connected, we have to stay connected, but you don't want right. to overdo it because if you burn that part out, then it's not that much we have in the tank left to give Very at true. this point. So I just think that, you know, limiting the number of Zooms to two a day, 10 a week, you know, maximum. Um, you know, spending more time outside, I think it's very important, especially now the weather is warming up, um, you know, being more active, staying physically fit, um, allowing yourself some time for relaxation, you know, and that does not equal sleep. So you actually need some mm. time to where you are cognizant and alive and, and just living and to when you're actually chilling and relaxing and watching TV. You know, if it feels strange to watch a little TV because you haven't done it forever, you, you may be working a little too hard. Um, right. you know, t turn off the social media, you know, for those of you that are yeah. spending okay. way too much time on there, turn it off, you know, or delete the app for a day. You know, mm. it's, it's funny. This will let you know how, how addicted you are to something. If, if it's difficult to do without it for a day, that lets you know that you are way into your, your into deep. All right. So I like that. I like that. Yeah. So you package all those things together. Um, and then you, you mix that in with having control over your routine. You're mixing it up. And that'll at least kind of give you like some some additional tools and a toolbox to deal with this. Uh, I know a lot of states are starting to open back up. Now down here in Atlanta, we've been open for it. it seems like we never closed, right? Yeah, it seems and, like it. <laughs> we'll be at close so, soon enough. Don't worry. Yeah, we definitely will be. But you know, it's I think that it is okay to have um, a plan. And one more thing, one more tip I've been letting people know: this is your opportunity to let your job know what your transition plan back in the work is going to be because oh, they've never done okay. they, they, okay. they've never done this before like i okay. promise you in the, in the standards and operating for the sop there's not a plan for how to survive the pandemic with your business and so as they are coming up with their own plan you got to be at work on this day and you know you got to have this you know you give them your transition plan hey listen schools are out i have my kids on these days this is the type of support that i have do you mind if i continue to work virtually on mondays and fridays and i come into the office on tuesdays and thursdays I like you, it. You know, like so that. you okay. you give you give your and if not the institution, just your immediate supervisor, and then that way you all can work together as a team. I like that, uh, and I think we got to wrap up soon. But I want to say thank you, Dr. Vaughn Gay, for that because you've been able to just get through and just let people know, kind of boom, 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 on what to do. How can people get in contact with you, or how can they book a session with you? Gotcha. So um, the best way to find me is on Instagram. Um, you can uh, search for me at the ATL LPC. That's T H E A T L L P C, the Atlanta Licensed Professional Counsel is what that stands for. Also, my practice, uh, my healthcare brand that I'm building, I started speaking that into bigger, bigger language. It's more than just a practice, uh, Holistic Atlanta. So you can find my website, www.holisticatlanta.com. If you would like to schedule a session, send me an email to info at Holistic Atlanta. It's info at HolisticAtlanta.com, and we will definitely respond to you within about 48 hours and get you on the calendar. All right. Thank you once again, uh, Dr. Gay, for uh, taking us the time out today on a Sunday afternoon. Um, I appreciate it. Yeah. And once again, you guys, if you haven't already, please make sure you follow uh, Dr. Gay. Can you Instagram handle one more time? At the ATL LPC and also at Holistic Atlanta. All right. And once again, this is King Williams. Thank you again for listening to this podcast. Wherever you heard this podcast, please like and review it um, and subscribe to it as well. If you haven't already, also sign up to my newsletter at iamkingwilliams.substack.com. Again, iamkingwilliams.substack.com. Thank you very much. All right. That was good.